Welcome to How Ecology Works. In this podcast, we cover all topics in ecology and how you might apply them in your future career. All right, so I'm sitting here with Dr. Heather Alexander from Auburn University and Dr. Steve Brewer from the University of Mississippi, and they are both experts on the role that fire has played in our eastern forest systems. And also, uh, they have some pretty interesting things, I think, to tell us about the historical context that these forest systems existed in and how they compare to what we see today. So, Dr. Brewer, can you tell us a little bit about the history of our forests in the eastern United States? Sure. Well, first of all, um, the forests uh, and the composition of the forests, you know, the types of species, they, they've been changing, you know, over, you know, uh, millions of years. Um, uh, climate has been, you know, probably the, for the most part, the bit, been one of the great drivers of the changes in composition of forests that we've seen. Um, up until kind of the 20th century, when we start seeing um, modern kind of uh, industrial forestry and also uh, fire suppression campaigns, uh, though those activities also uh, change the composition of the forest. If you were to walk into a mature upland uh, oak dominated forest, say in Mississippi or Alabama, uh, uh, today, most of what, you know, most of what you would see is, uh, uh, large oaks dominating the overstory. Um, but they would be largely absent from the, the mid story. And what you would have instead are a lot of species that historically would have been primarily restricted as trees to floodplains. Um, and so that change that, that indicates a change, a fairly uh, recent change in the last 100 to 200 years. And what has happened is modern fire exclusion has allowed fire-sensitive species that were um, historically restricted to floodplains to basically move upland into formerly open oak-dominated uh, systems and basically take over the mid-story of those systems. And, you know, there's lots of data that uh, supports, you know, this change. I mean, one that just explores accounts of what forests looked like in, say, the early 1800s. Um, also, one piece of data that I've used a lot for my own research are the witness tree records of the original surveyors, you know, when the in northern Mississippi, for example, when the Chickasaw Indians ceded their land uh, uh, to Mississippi, then there was surveying of the land. Basically, they would try to locate um, sections and corners of those sections. And the way they would do that is they would, they would have to get their bearings and they would use whatever trees were nearby as uh, to... Uh, help get their bearings and set corner stakes or uh, at the corners of sections um, in the township range system. Well, they would identify the trees too, not always very specifically, but uh, specifically enough with common names used at that time that when we look at the composition of the trees, of those witness trees, and compare that to the composition of trees dominating more modern forests today that have uh, allowed to grow back and uh, are somewhat mature, we see this difference in composition. Well, we don't see an almost exclusive dominance in uplands by oaks and to some extent hickory that we saw in those witness tree records. What we see today is we still see oaks and hickories, but we also see these other tree species in these forests that would have also been in the survey records, but they almost always were in floodplains, right near within a mile or a half a mile of, say, the Tallahatchie River or the Yachna River, or, you know, some of these major rivers here in uh, northern Mississippi. So it's really, really distinctive. It's uh, if you 
have never done it, I, I, would, I strongly urge you to uh, look at the, grant, the general land office records just, to, just so you can see for yourself what a dramatic change that there has been um, in tree species composition from uh, you know, uh, historical you know, sort of pre-modern times to what we see uh, today. And it's all consistent with fire being the factor, the main factor that has changed between now and then. There are other factors too that are, that are involved, but the loss of fire from the modern systems has resulted in this uh, uh, dramatic change that we see, has contributed to this dramatic change that we see. That's really interesting. And it's interesting to think about all the kinds of records, you know, you're kind of creatively using a record that, that was uh, established for a different reason entirely, but you're able to uh, compare that. It sounds like what we typically think of, you know, when we walk into a forest that has a closed canopy with, with very little regeneration in the mid story or understory that, you know, we think of that as a natural forest, and it sounds like what you're saying is that's a, a novel ecosystem to what historically was on the landscape in the eastern U.S. Heather, I was really curious if you could add to that with the role that fire played in that system and why it maintained it in an open forest system, and what, you know, how do we get back to that? Yeah, it's really interesting to think about what role fire played because now, you know, we live on this landscape that's very um, parcelized and fragmented and it's very hard to think about fire moving across this huge region on a pretty regular basis, at least in the upland oak forest, thought to be every five to seven years or so that fire would return to the same parcel of land. But back then, you know, things were way more connected. We didn't have fences and roads and things the way that we do now to, to, to separate the movement of fire. But we think that fires were pretty common. They were ignited by Native Americans for a variety of different reasons to clear the understory, to help with hunting and to promote berry growth, uh, to reduce pet, pest and pathogens, you know, get rid of uh, bugs and biting insects and uh, they were also lightning ignited, you know, during the growing season, we would have thunderstorms come through and fires would be um, ignited by lightning strikes. And when they were ignited, they were a lot, you know, they just burn and they burned. Um, oftentimes they would smolder and carry and they would just move across this landscape in a way that really kept the density of trees low, kept things pretty open and sparse. And you had species that were adapted to that fire environment, thriving species like upland oaks and pines, they did really well. You know, they need that highlight environment, a little competition. And those were the dominant trees like, like Steve described, and they were pretty sparse. And so, you know, it was more like a savanna or a woodland. And most of those trees would, you know, they would have pretty thick bark. So if a fire came through, it was protected from the heat of those flames. Um, little guys, if they got top killed by fire, would re-sprout because they had pretty um, large root systems that gave them the energy to do that. You know, and they had, uh, you know, the fires were not super intense because they were being carried by an herbaceous fuel bed that didn't burn that hot or, um, you know, with pockets of leaf litter of the, the, the trees that were more uh, sparse in those systems. And so, you know, once we took fire out, like Steve said, you start getting these, we call them mesophytes, they're kind of water or shade loving, you know, like cool, damp, moist environments start coming in. And those are, you know, species that used to be restricted to more riparian moist areas, and they, but they're light seeded, they, uh, they take over quite easily, they're kind of weedy in their growth habits. And what they do is they grow up quick. They have a kind of grow fast, uh, live fast, die young, um, growth model. And what that does is it creates a pretty shady environment for those slower growing fire tolerant species. And eventually over time, those mesophytes take over and our fire loving species start to decline, which is why when you walk through the oak forest and some pine forest now you see, you may see some big oaks and pines, but you don't see a lot of 
for generation in the understory unless unless fire is being used as a uh, management tool in those systems. You know, you're talking about how frequently fire was re-entering the system just when uh, you know Native Americans and or lightning were lighting it. And I mean, some of the places in Florida, there's evidence that it was a sub two year return interval where in uh, some sites may have even burned as much as twice a year and some at some points during the, the uh, past. So it's pretty crazy to think about in some of our pine systems that fire was in the system naturally that frequently. But even in our upland hardwood systems, it was still recurring in sub-decade uh, intervals, at least, in those systems. I think another thing that's important to think about in this context is, you know, the plant community is changing and the structure of those communities. And we're kind of, uh, you know, our generation has really not seen it in that open context, but also it's not a part of our culture anymore to, to uh, think that is aesthetically pleasing necessarily. But the other thing is a lot of our wildlife species that are of conservation concern are connected to that open pine or open oak forest canopy structure where you have recurring fire that manages it in that open system dynamic. So I think that's pretty important to think about uh, when we're thinking about conservation in these systems. All right, well, I really appreciate you uh, telling us about the history of our forests. I think that uh, is really a great way for us to, to get a quick uh, <clears throat> view or a uh, you know, mental image of what those system looks like from the experts. So I really appreciate you all coming on the show and, and uh, telling us about that. Thanks. Welcome. Thanks.